If you have your Bibles this evening, turn with me to the book of Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. We're going to continue our series entitled Peace on Earth. Pastor Bob opened up last week talking about the purpose of peace. And if you ever want to watch our sermons uh, again, you could, always, you could always watch them online, uh, and those are there available for you to, to watch, though, just in case you missed something, or maybe you were uh, out of town or something, I don't know, maybe you were sick, uh, and you missed a service, you could always keep up there. Luke chapter 2 and verse 8. The Bible says this, it says, That night some shepherds were in the fields outside the village, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly, the Bible says, an angel appeared among them, and the landscape shone bright with the glory of the Lord. They were badly frightened, but the angel reassured them, do not be afraid. I bring you the most joyful news ever announced, and it is for everyone. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born tonight in Bethlehem. How will you recognize him? You will find a baby wrapped in a blanket, lying in a manger. Suddenly, the angel was joined by a vast ho a host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God. As they were praising, glory to God in the highest heaven, they sang, and peace on earth for all those pleasing him. Let's pray this evening. Heavenly Father, we ask that you have your way this evening, Lord. Give me the words to speak, Lord, for your church, that we would be edified through your word, that we would not only be hearers, but doers of your word. And in that, we will see your blessings in our lives. Father, we thank you. We give you all the glory and honor. In Jesus' name, the church says, amen, amen. Peace on earth. And this whole month, as we, as we discover how our lives are affected by the peace that God provides you and I. And tonight, we're going to be discussing the promise of peace. Write that down. The promise of peace. I'm sure there's people here tonight that you may find yourself afraid of heights. I'm not going to take a hand and see who's afraid of heights. I don't want to call you out or embarrass you. But maybe you're an individual who won't get on a ladder because you're afraid of heights. You won't get on certain amusement park rides because you're afraid. You won't look out, you won't look uh, uh, over a, a, a handrail, over a balcony because you're afraid of heights. I remember one of my coworkers. Uh, we work in Long Beach, and I remember uh, we do many things over in the port of Long Beach. And so you got to cross this ginormous bridge, right? And so even driving over the bridge, he would be afraid. He would literally be afraid. I would look over, and I would ask him, are you all right? Are you going to be all right? But this is what heights do to individuals. It reminds me of, the, of that picture, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with this picture that was taken probably like in the early 30s, I believe, as these iron workers were building the Rockefeller Center. And it shows, it shows these men sitting on this beam having lunch 850 feet above the ground. On a beam, having lunch. Just looking at that picture scares me. I'm not, I'm not one who is afraid of heights, but I draw a line somewhere. <laughs> and looking at that, I think, wow, these, these men were of a different breed. <laughs> See, something that has come into fruition over the years that is that these that are today construction workers use is something called a harness. If you're familiar with a harness, you know how it works, you know how it looks. That harness is to keep you, if you were to slip and fall, it will keep you 
from getting injured or possibly dying. And this is something that has been implemented over the years, right? You didn't see that in the picture. You know, that was, that's a Cal OSHA nightmare today. <laughs> for all of you Cal OSHA people here, I don't know if you work for Cal OSHA, but we deal with them a lot. And just seeing that scares a lot of people. But you see what people use nowadays, and they use this harness. Why? Why? Because that brings security, doesn't it? It'll allow individuals who may have not been willing to step out on that beam 850 feet above the ground, that they might reconsider and say, you know what, I'll do it as long as I have the harness. I believe I would do it as long as I have a harness. There's something about knowing that even if you were to slip and fall, that this is going to save you from death. Isaiah 26, verse 3 says this. It says, you will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you, all whose thoughts are fixed on you. Another version of Isaiah 26, 3 says this. You keep completely safe. Say that with me, safe. Say, God will keep me safe. You will keep completely safe the people who maintain their faith, for they trust in you. What does that mean? That means you and I must place our faith. We must place our trust in the Lord. We put our trust in many things. These workers today put their trust in those harnesses, that it's going to save them, that if they had an accident and they were to fall, it's, there's, no, there's no need to really be concerned or worry because that harness is there to protect you. See, God wants you and I to understand that he is that harness for you and I. He's there to protect you. Why? Because there's going to be times when we slip and fall, isn't it? There's going to be times. Maybe you had some today where you slipped and fell. But God says, I am that harness to protect you. I am that harness to keep you from death. This is providing peace in your life. See, he promises to keep us in perfect peace. See, real peace isn't connected to our health or our wealth, right? It's only connected to the Prince of Peace. Tonight, I want to talk about peace as a right relationship with God. See, because of the enemy's deceit and the disobedience and sin of man, look at what God tells the serpent in Genesis 3.15. Genesis 3.15, God tells this to the serpent, and he says, I will cause hostility between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He says, I will cause what? Hostility. God says, I will cause hostility between you and and the woman between her offspring and your offspring. Man, it's no wonder why. There's days that we just feel totally exhausted. You feel, you feel spiritually fatigued. Why? Because there is a real enemy that you have hostility with. There's a real battle taking place for your life, for your soul. It's really taking place. I know you may not see it up front, but it's happening in your life. And there is a hostility that you and I are living in with the enemy. And that's what God has told the serpent. How many of us have been, ever encountered a hostile environment? 
Maybe you had to correct someone at work, and they didn't, they didn't take that correction very well. So now, now you find yourself, you find that that workplace has now become a hostile environment. Because you don't know what this person is going to do. They didn't say anything, and so you're worried about, about, about retaliation. It's become a hostile environment. Maybe you and your spouse had an argument at home. Now that home has become a hostile environment. How many of you are like me and you don't want to live in a hostile environment, amen? You want to make sure that there is peace in that home. You want to make sure that there is peace in your job place or in, in your workplace. Wherever you are, that there is peace. See, hostility is the opposite of peace, isn't it? Yes? Would you agree with that? It's the opposite of peace. You think of peace and you think of comfort and you think of, you think of, 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 of just everything going right. And then you think of hostility and you think of conflict. You think of heads butting. You think of, you think of, of anger and all these kind of things. It's the opposite. You and I don't want to live in that kind of environment. But God says in Genesis 3.15 that because of sin, we are living in exactly that. See, every day is a battle for our mind, our thoughts, our ears, our hearts. Every day is a battle. But as sin brought hostility in the world, God had a plan to help and save us. How many thank God for that, that he has a plan? Amen? How many of you thank God? Thank God. God, I thank you for your plan. I thank you that, that you have, that you always, always have something in play that is going to help me, that is going to save me, and that is going to give me another opportunity to make things right. God is so gracious. Isaiah 9, verse 6 says, for a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. And it says, there will be no end to his peace. Oh, that's beautiful. Not only is he the Prince of Peace, but the Bible says there is no end to his peace. See, God wants to take us from hostility to peace, shalom, which means wholeness. God wants us to go from being an enemy to being a friend, right? We're talking about having a right relationship with God. This is what his peace is. His peace is for us to, have a, 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 to, to be in wholeness, where everything is right with us and God then you and I can experience his peace. Because that's exactly what it means. Shalom. See, Jesus came to make peace between us and God. And the promises of God will always come to pass. How many know that to be true tonight? They always come to pass. God's word is always true. What he says he means and his word will stand, his promises will stand through all generations. Isaiah 9-2 says, The people who walk in darkness shall see a great light, a light that will shine on all those who live in the land of the shadow of death. See, this was our condition. We were living in darkness. But Jesus came to deliver you and I out of that darkness to make it possible for us to be forgiven. The Bible refers to it in verse 5 as the glorious day of peace. What a glorious day, amen, when we found ourselves in right standing with God. When you and I made a decision to follow Christ. When you and I made a decision to submit our will, to put it, aside our will and our desires and follow God. 
God, I want to follow, I want to do your will. I want your will for my life, God. I know I have my own plans, Lord, but I want your plan for my life. What a glorious day that was. Have any of you ever wondered, why did God have to send Jesus to die for us in order to be forgiven? You know, God could have just forgiven us very easily, right? Just by mere words, right? Couldn't he have? He's God. He could have just said, you're forgiven. And guess what? You're forgiven. Why did he have to send Jesus to die for our sins? I'll tell you why. Because forgiveness always, remember this, forgiveness always comes at a cost. Remember that. Forgiveness always comes at a cost. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 20, Paul writes this. And he says, for God has bought you with a great price. See, when you forgive someone, it means that you are choosing to forego the payment that you deserve for the wrong that was done to you. whether it was accidental or intentional. Let me give you an example. Say you're at your friend's house and you accidentally spill uh, a glass of juice on their brand new sofa. And your friend, because they're your friend, they say, oh, you know what? Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. I'll take care of it. What are they saying? They're saying that I will absorb the cost of your mistake. I forgive you. By saying that I forgive you, what they're saying is I will absorb the cost. Remember, forgiveness always comes at a cost. There's always a cost in forgiveness. It's not free. So when you spill that on their sofa, someone's going to have to pay for it, right? It will not be miraculously clean by the next morning. You will not wake up and, you know, you had some elves come in the house for Christmas and they cleaned your sofa. <laughs> that's, not a, that's not even true. You, you may have to buy some product to clean that sofa. You may even have to hire someone to clean that stain off of your brand new sofa. But what you're telling that individual is you're saying, you know what, I will take on those costs. You don't have to pay for it. I got it. Don't worry about it. And that's how forgiveness works. There's always a cost. Someone always has to pay. I remember when my brother drove into our garage when he was learning how to drive. <laughs> my dad didn't make him pay for it. He didn't, he didn't say, oh, you know what, now you're going to have to work for that for the next 10 years. <laughs> he didn't say that. What he did was basically he, in a sense, forgave him by taking on the cost himself to fix the garage he said I forgive you and in that forgiveness I will incur the cost do you see how that works do you see how forgiveness works someone always has to pay when a husband speaks harshly to his wife wounding and hurting her he can, ha he can ask for her forgiveness, and she may grant it, but make no mistake, she still bears the burdens of his words. She still carries the wounds. There's always a cost. There's always, always a cost. When a friend betrays the trust of another friend, that individual may ask for forgiveness and the other friend may grant it. But again, 
the other friend will have to live with that broken heart. And they have to in, take on the cost of what was done, of the trust that was betrayed in that relationship. You see, forgiveness is not free. Always, always a cost. And that's why God, knowing the cost of forgiveness, knowing how this works, that's why God didn't just say, boom, you're forgiven. Because that would have been easier. To many, it would make more sense. But God knows that to be forgiven, someone has to pay. So God sent his son, Jesus Christ. And he said, my son, get this, my son will pay for your sin. Isn't that something there? Man, who God is, is mind-blowing. We can't even fathom the love that God has for you and I. You can't even understand it. I don't believe the human mind can grasp the fullness of God's love. You can't. You can't comprehend it. You know those times in our lives when someone may hurt us and we want to, in a sense, make them pay for it? Right? Has anyone ever tried to make someone pay for the wrong that they did to them? Maybe you gave them the silent treatment, right? You didn't talk to them for weeks on end. I'm going to make them pay for it. That's what you're saying. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get back at them. I'm going to try to take from them what they took from me. I'm going to get back. The cost that came from my life, I'm going to get that back from them. And we do this as, as people, as human beings. We try to make others pay for what they've done. So you can see how this works. See, but God doesn't do that to us. Thank you, Jesus. He doesn't do that to us. What did God do for you and I? was that he absorbed that cost of our sin. Every lie, every hurtful word, every act of disobedience by sending his son, Jesus Christ. Isaiah 53, verse 5 says this, but he was wounded and bruised for our sins. He was beaten that we might have peace. Wow. Does that hit you in a different perspective? Hearing how forgiveness works? Hearing, hearing that, that, that you know, it always comes at a cost and what, and what Jesus did for you and I, I hope it opens your eyes a little more to see the price that was paid for you. He says he was beaten that we might have peace. He was lashed and we were healed. He was lashed and we were healed. Wow. Every one of us, it says, have strayed away like sheep. We who left God's paths to follow our own. Yet, God laid on him, Jesus, the guilt and sins of every one of us. Mm. That's deep. When you begin to understand what Jesus did for you, that he was dying for your sin, that in order for you to be forgiven, in order for you to be at peace with God, that there had to be a cost. There had to be a cost because in the beginning, when that serpent deceived Adam and Eve, and Adam and Eve sinned, God said that there will now be hostility 
between you, between both parties, there will be hostility. But many people are living in hostility with God. And God says, I want to bring peace in your life. Peace is that wholeness. Peace is making, is making right the relationship between God and us. I want you to write this down. How you treat God, write this down. How you treat God determines how you will experience him. How you treat God determines how you will experience him. What do I mean by that? That means that if you treat God as your refuge, your safe place, he becomes your rock. God, you're my refuge. What does that mean? That means that, God, I want to be with you. I want you to be with me because you are my safe place. And as we draw close to God, because we see him as our refuge, he becomes our rock. But if you treat God as, as incapable, if you treat God as weak, if you treat God as unimportant, by going to other things instead of him. And then we wonder why we find ourselves anxious. We wonder why we find ourselves worried, stressed out, afraid, upset. It's because we've been treating God as if he is weak. We're not going to him. We're not running to him as our, as our refuge. We're running to other things. We're running to maybe friends. We're running to, to, to maybe uh, addictions. We're running to these things. And what we're saying is, God, you are not capable of helping me right now. Wow. What would happen in our life if we treated God as if he is God? What would happen? How would that look? Let me paint a better picture for us tonight. How did David treat God when he met the great Philistine giant? How did he treat God? Did David view God as weak? How did Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego treat God when they wouldn't Worship the false gods because they believed in the sovereignty of God. How did Daniel treat God? He viewed his time with God as necessary. And nothing and nobody was going to get in the way of his time with God. What did God do for David? What did he do? As David looked at that giant Philistine, David's a little guy. That giant was twice his size. But he looked at that giant, and he didn't, he didn't come at that giant with his own power. What did David say to the giant? You come at me with these weapons and, and all this kind of stuff and your big old voice and your, and your big old body thinking you're going to scare me. But I come to you in the name of God. I come to you in the name of the creator. I don't know who you think you are, but you must not know my God. See, David didn't come at the giant he didn't come at him thinking that he's serving a weak God. No, he came at that giant knowing that God is all-powerful. That all he had to do was step out and God was going to give him victory. Why? Because God doesn't fail. What did God do for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? When they refused to worship the false gods. 
And they said, no, 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 no. There's only one God. There's only one God. He is the sovereign God. That means that he is supreme. There's only one God. I only bow to one God. All these things you have right here for me to bow down to, no way. It's not going to happen. I don't care what you do. I serve the sovereign God. What did God do for them? God saved them from the blazing furnace. They still went in the blazing furnace, amen, but God protected them while they were in there. Isn't that amazing? That's amazing. Why? Because they treated God as if he was God. What did God do for Daniel? When Daniel said, I'm not going to pray to all, these, to all these other things that you want me to pray or, or, or stop praying to God. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to keep praying. I, I love my time with God. I treasure my time with God. I need my time with God. No one is going to stop me from meeting with him. And as he was thrown in the hungry lion's den, and God shut the mouths of those hungry lions. God was showing his power at work in their lives. And what he was saying is, look, when you treat me as God, you're going to see my power at work in your life. You're going to see it. You're going to see it evident in the experiences in your life. You will experience his peace, the wholeness, a right relationship with God the Father. Isaiah 9, 7, we read, it, we read it earlier. It says that there will be no end. You and I can experience God's peace forever. See, God's peace means that everything is as it should be. To be whole. John 14, 27. John 14, 27, Jesus says this. He says, I am leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart. And the peace I give you isn't fragile like the peace the world gives. So don't be troubled or afraid. Remember what I told you. I am going away, but I will come back to you again. Jesus says, I'm coming back from high church. I'm coming back. I may be going away right now, but don't be afraid. Don't lose heart because I'm coming back. I made a promise to you, Jesus says, and I will hold to that promise because I don't make promises that I can't keep. We're talking about the promise of peace here, how God promised to bring us peace, how God promised to bring us back into right standing, into a right relationship with him. What took place thousands of years ago, God says, I have a plan. I have a plan. Even though man sinned, I have a plan. And that plan is to bring you back into peace. Brother Joe Gax mentioned in his sermon a couple weeks ago, what a great sermon it was. If you haven't, if you, haven't if you, didn't, you missed it, uh, go back and, and watch it. That in, he said that in the midst of the battle that is taking place in the Middle East, he said that Muslims are turning to Christ. In the midst of the battle, in the midst of the chaos, in the midst of all the, of all the bullets flying, all the bombs, you know, flying over their homes. In the midst of all that, Muslims are turning to Christ. What am I saying? In the midst of chaos, they're experiencing peace. Isn't that something? Think about that. Because what is peace? Peace is being in right standing with God. And as they come to Christ in these times... It doesn't matter what's, what's, what's overhead. It doesn't matter, it doesn't matter what's taking place uh, 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 at, their, at their front door. They're experiencing God's peace because they are choosing to be in right standing with God. 
It reminds me of Paul in the Bible. And I, as I mentioned before in a, in a past sermon, how, how Paul, you know, Paul was persecuting Christians, right? Wasn't he? Thinking that he was doing the Lord's work. You know, and, and so basically, you know, basically, you know, Paul was, Paul was a terrorist. You know, but God, God turned him into an evangelist. He was persecuting Christians, thinking that what he was doing was actually the Lord's work. Romans 11.25 says this. Yes, it is true that some of the people of Israel, I want you to listen to this. Yes, it is true, Paul says, that some of the people of Israel have set themselves against the gospel now. But this will last only until all of you Gentiles have come to Christ. Those of you who will. And then all Israel will be saved. Do you remember what the prophet said about this? There shall come out of Jerusalem a deliverer. And he shall turn Israel away from ungodliness. At that time, I will take away their sins just as I promised. Now check this out. Now many of the people of Israel are enemies of the gospel. They hate it. But this has been a benefit to you. For it has resulted in, God, in God's giving his gifts to you Gentiles. Yet the people of Israel are still beloved of God because of his promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. For God's gifts and his call can never be withdrawn. He will never go back on his promises. What is he saying? Well, there will be a time when Israel, as a nation, will turn their hearts to Christ. There will be a time. There will be a time. The Bible says so. It says it right here. And what a glorious time that will be. As our worship team comes forward this evening. The Bible says this. I want you to catch this. The Bible says that we as Gentiles are blessed even through the disobedience of Israel. Did you hear that? Did you hear that? The Bible says that we as Gentiles are blessed even through the disobedience of Israel. Why? Because because of Israel's disobedience, God gave his gifts to the Gentiles. To be saved, to be forgiven, to be in right standing. So, let's go a little further in this. If you and I are blessed as Gentiles, if we are blessed through Israel's disobedience, can you imagine how blessed we will be through their obedience, through their surrender to Christ as a nation. We're blessed even through their disobedience. But what an amazing time that will be when as a nation they turn to Christ and we are blessed, truly, truly blessed by God. God has promised us peace, wholeness, to be in a healthy, right relationship with God. That's what he wants for you and I. To be in a healthy, right relationship with God. That's peace. We're no, we're no longer in hostility with God. We may find ourselves still in hostility with the enemy, but we are not enemies of God. We are now in his peace. You can now experience his peace. Why? Because you are in a right relationship with him. And don't worry about being an enemy of, 
of Satan because God is more powerful, amen? God is greater, so don't worry, amen? Don't worry about living in hostility with the enemy because God's got you. He's got you. He's that, he's that, he's our refuge, right? God is our refuge. Start treating him like that. You and I need to start looking at God as our refuge. We need to start viewing God and treating him as if he can do all things. Because he can. We need to start treating God like he is the answer to every problem that we encounter in life. Every naysayer, God is the God is God is the one who's going to fight my battles. It doesn't matter what so and so says, God is fighting my battles. Whatever it is in your life, God says you find yourself at peace now. You're at peace. You're in right standing with me. And it's all because of my son, Jesus Christ. You've received forgiveness, but that forgiveness wasn't free. My son paid a heavy price. God says, I paid a heavy price. Do you know the hurt? Do you know the hurt that I experienced? seen my son on that cross. You don't know what it caused me. You don't know, you don't know what that was like. But it was all for you. It was all for you. Forgiveness always comes at a cost. How many of you are thankful for the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ, who brings us into right standing with God. Let's worship him tonight. Let's worship him. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Let's worship him tonight. He is the Prince of Peace. He's brought us into right standing with God. Lord, we give you praise. Lord, we give you honor. We give you glory, Lord. Your name above all names. Worship him, church. Now is the time giving praise. Why would you stop giving God praise? Why would you stop? He is worthy of praise. He is worthy. He is worthy. He is mighty. He loves you. He has a plan for you. He has not forgotten you. You are his. You are his. what the world says it doesn't matter what the world is doing we will not stop worshiping you Lord we will not stop giving you praise we will not bow down to the idols of the world we will not bow down to these false gods we serve the sovereign God the King of Kings the Lord of Lords and it doesn't matter what the opposition is how many come against us Lord you are greater and you have given us victory Lord, you have given us victory. You have given us victory. Just as you gave David victory. Just as you gave Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego victory. Just as you gave Daniel victory. Lord, you are giving us victory tonight. You are giving us victory tonight, Lord. In our circumstances, Lord. You're giving us victory. You're getting us through, Lord. As every head is bowed, every eye closed.